we are here with Claire Sojan. Claire is a professor at Paris University at the Integrative Neuroscience and Cognition Center. She did her PhD at the lab of Stanislas Dehan, who is the main proponent of the Global Neuronal Workspace Theory, or GNW in short. She has many, many publications, among them famous works on this theory. And we are very happy to have you here today talking about the global workspace and the global playground. Well, th thank you very much, Ronnie, and thanks to the organizers. Um, I'm very glad to have the, of course, I would like to be with you, but I'm very glad to have still the opportunity to uh, take part. So uh, can I share my screen? Yes. Uh, right. So um, today I'm going to talk about the global workspace and the global playground, and I hope uh, these terms will be clearer to you at the end of the of the presentation. Um, I'd like to start by saying that uh, I'm not on my own in this adventure. So uh, everything I'm going to talk about has involved many people, among which people uh, that are currently in my team, alumni to my team, and many collaborators. Uh, so within um, the different topics uh, that are tackled in the science of consciousness today, and there are many of them, I, I think that uh, Axel Clearman's presented uh, several aspects of this uh, problem. Um, I'm particularly interested in conscious access. That means uh, becoming conscious of a specific content at a specific time. For example, sensation, but it could be thought, memory, etc. cetera. Um, so to, um, to give you a better intuition of what I mean by conscious access, uh, I always like to make a little demo and I hope it will work. Uh, uh, across the Mediterranean Sea, <laughs> so we'll see. So uh, uh, I'm going to start this little video and there will be a, a little green dot that will be blinking in the middle. And I just ask you to fixate this little green dot. Okay, so I hope that it works. If it doesn't, I will send you the video so you can see for yourself. But uh, uh, usually in the right conditions, at some point when you're fixating the green dot, um, one or several of the yellow dot disappears. Interestingly, the yellow dots never actually disappear from the screen. They disappear from your conscious access. Okay. So, uh, what these kind of phenomena suggest is that it's not because your brain is processing uh, an information that you're conscious of this information. In this case, these yellow dots are always on your retina and they are always uh, processed by your brain uh, to some extent. So my big question is, what's the difference in your brain when you're processing the same information consciously or non-consciously? And that's really the story of my life, or at least of my professional life. <laughs> okay, so uh, in in this uh, keynote, uh, here are the three things I'd like to do. Uh, try to give you an idea, like in a nutshell, of the state of the art and the current challenge in, uh, uh, in research on the neural mechanisms of conscious access. Uh, give you an idea of our approach, uh, what we're doing in the team and how we tackle this challenge. And in doing so, I wish to show you how we managed to make a crosstalk between our experimentation and a specific model, uh, as Ronnie said, uh, the global workspace model, and how uh, we were driven to make it evolve. Okay, so uh, first, try to uh, uh, have a sort of state of the art uh, of uh, what we know now. Um, 
I'm going to present what is now a, a classic study where we do this contrast I was referring to, contrasting uh, becoming conscious of a stimulus versus um, processing it unconsciously for exactly the same external stimulus. Well, we did that now a long time ago using a, a phenomenon that's called the attentional blink, uh, which is a, a, a very interesting protocol in which the same stimulus, for example, here we used words written on the screen, the same stimulus uh, is sometimes uh, perceived by the subjects. Uh, they will tell you tell us at the end of the the trial that they uh, have seen the stimulus and sometimes not and they say that they haven't seen the stimulus so that's a perfect situation uh in which we can contrast conscious versus non-conscious processing what we have to do is just record the uh, uh the brain activity between the presentation of the, of the stimulus and what people tell us about the stimulus and sort the trials according to what they told us, okay? Uh, and we did that with the uh, electroencephalography, EG, and what we observed was, okay, sorry, quite straightforward. Uh, first, we observed that during uh, the first 250 milliseconds after the presentation of the stimulus, uh, brain activity was not different uh, in seen versus not seen trials, meaning that indeed the brain was processing uh, the sensory information, even uh, in the trials where at the end people said, I haven't seen the stimulus at all. Uh, but interestingly, after 250 milliseconds after the stimulus, we observe a drastic distinction between the two types of uh, processing. On scene trials, we see a succession of uh, waveforms that are to totally absent for not scene trials. So very drastic uh, difference, although the stimulus was exactly the same. So uh, with this uh, electric activity that we record on the scalp, we can try to reconstruct what happens in the brain and and then have a, a sort of film of what's happening in the brain when we become conscious. So below here, it's when people said that they have seen, above that they have not seen, and here you see the, the brain from below. And here is a little timer relative to the presentation of the stimulus. And what we see is that uh, the first activations we see in the brain are nice occipital activations, it's the visual brain lighting up, but same uh, in seen and not seen trials. And then the activation is moving into the temporal cortex, uh, and again, as strong in seen and not seen trials. Uh, and up to 250 milliseconds, where we seem to see a divergence between the two types of trials. Uh, on scene trials, something seems to have hooked and we're going for uh, a sequence of activations where you'll see nice uh, activations in frontal areas as well as temporal areas. The whole brain seems to be interested in this, uh, uh, in this information and it lasts uh, for at least half a second after the presentation of the stimulus, whereas all this sequence is absent on trials where people said that they haven't seen the stimulus, okay? So um, the way we interpreted uh, these uh, results was, as I was saying, within uh, the global workspace framework, what seems to be the case, at least in this uh, experiment, is that the uh, initial stages of uh, sensory processing up to 250 milliseconds after the presentation of the stimulus seem to be pre-conscious. It appears that it can unfold similarly, even if at the end uh, you say, I haven't seen versus you say, I've seen. Uh, and it seems that what counts for you to become conscious of the stimulus uh, 
uh, and that's our interpretation, is uh, the occurrence of these late activations. And these late activations might correspond to a form of global sharing of this information was, that was built up uh, locally in sensory cortices. And this global sharing uh, beyond sensory cortices, implying um, notably the attentional uh, network, uh, will allow a, um, an amplification of this information, a maintenance of this information, and an increased flexibility in what you can do with this information. And the global workspace proposition, in a nutshell, is saying that it's this uh, um, network that allows these functional properties that correspond to what we experience as conscious uh, processing. Okay, so uh, uh, there are several simulations of uh, this global workspace model that suggest that indeed, when you uh, when you look at the dynamics of a connectome uh, within some uh, parameters of connectivity, you obtain these kind of dynamics, like uh, initial uh, processing, uh, bottom up processing, and then. Uh, Either you trigger a global activation or you don't trigger it. So it seems to be a property of a, 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 a big connectome. Okay, so so far I'm telling you a, a dream a situation where uh, you have a, a theory and the, the experiment exactly corresponds to your theory and that's the end of it. But actually, that's not the end of it, obviously. And uh, if we look at, uh, if we look more generally at uh, the state of the art on the neural correlates of conscious access, and we're looking at all the uh, the experiments that try to do this contrast between uh, seeing and not seeing, or hearing and not see, uh, hearing the same stimulus, we see that some of them indeed show. Um, a drastic difference in late activations, but other, using other types of stimuli, or other protocols, will show earlier differences between conscious and unconscious processing. And still other experiments have shown that if you do this contrast, sometimes you see that activity before the stimulus is different between conscious and non-conscious uh, um, trials. So uh, it seems like uh, with all these studies, uh, we can acknowledge that indeed uh, this contrasting method uh, is showing us that indeed there is something different happening in our brain when we become conscious of a stimulus, but uh, these correlates uh, take up too much. And we're at a, a turning point where among all these correlates, uh, we would like to distinguish what corresponds to core mechanisms of conscious access from other mechanisms uh, that might be precursor sensory processes. So variations in uh, the strength of sensory processes that will finally lead you to become conscious of the stimulus or not. And on the other hand, dissociate that from consequences of conscious access, such as uh, all the executive processes that you can uh, that you can explore once you become conscious of the stimulus. Okay, so um, our current research in my team is really. Uh, tackling these two uh, dissociations and trying to um, identify the core mechanisms of conscious access in this way. So, that, uh, so that's how I'm going to structure my presentation. And first, we'll uh, tackle the, the first uh, topic, decoupling conscious access from task-related uh, processes. So why is it important first? Uh, well, you've noticed that uh, in the in the experiment in the experiment I have presented so so far, we've asked subject to make a task on the stimulus. We've asked subjects to report uh, what they had seen. Well, that uh, might be a confound when you're trying to find the mechanisms of conscious access. 
because what the late activations we see might actually correspond to uh, task-related processes. The fact that not only the, the subject has become conscious of the stimulus, but that because they are conscious, they can um, uh, respond to the task and report the stimulus. Okay, so how can we dissociate uh, becoming conscious proper uh, from these uh, task-related processes? Uh, well, we conducted uh, a, a recent study where we tried to see whether uh, bifurcation dynamics, that is the fact that you can, uh, for the same stimulus, either trigger or not these late uh, activations uh, can be found in the general case and even in the absence of a task. So it it might uh, suggest then that these uh, late all or non activations are linked to conscious access independently of the task. So more specifically, uh, we performed um, uh, a protocol uh, using audition around threshold. Uh, in this protocol, so it was a very simple simulation. So you had a, a continuous noise like this. And within that noise, we inserted uh, uh, vowels, French vowels, uh, either A or E. Uh, and they were played at different intensity levels around uh, the consciousness uh, threshold that was uh, minus 9, minus 7 dBs. And importantly, each uh, participant, there were 20 in this experiment, each participant came for uh, two sessions. One session where uh, they were active, that is, at the end of each trial, they had to tell us what was the vowel and how well they had heard it on an on a audibility scale. And in another session, they had the same stimulation, but uh, they knew that the vowel was irrelevant. And instead, at the end of each trial, they had to uh, answer a quiz question or uh, do a, a reaction time uh, task on a visual stimulus or uh, do uh, report what, what was there on their mind. So mind wandering proof. Okay, uh, and before we analyze uh, the, the results of these experiments, uh, we wanted to uh, be very specific about what we meant <clears throat> by bifurcation dynamics and have more specific predictions. So these are simulation and, and predictions about the two types of dynamics we want to contrast. So, um, in response to stimuli of various intensity, uh, we could have the brain respond with unimodal dynamics. That is, on each uh, uh, trial, uh, neural activity um, scales with the, the stimulation strength. And if you look at activity across trials for one level of simulation, uh, they all group around a single mean. So that's what we call unimodal dynamics. And this activation will increase with uh, stimulation strength. Bifurcation dynamics are different. Uh, in bifurcation dynamics, we assume that there is um, one specific level of stimulation where there will be a split between two types of trials. On some trials, uh, the activity actually will not be triggered. So uh, we will remain at the baseline. And on some other trials, we might have triggered activity relating to uh, the global workspace, for example, and then we'll see a higher level of global activity in the brain. Uh, and we'll see these two groups of trials around uh, the baseline mean versus a higher mean. Um, so how can we dissociate these two uh, dynamics? If we do the classical uh, um, processing of uh, averaging activity across trials uh, for each stimulation level, um, we see that uh, we cannot really distinguish between the, these two types of dynamics. But we thought if we do 
uh, another very simple thing that uh, that we don't often do with the with the these data, we just look at the variability of activity across trials. Uh, maybe it's diagnostic of uh, either dynamics. And indeed, it's the case. Uh, for unimodal dynamics, uh, we predict um, a monotonous uh, increase, possibly either a flat or monotonous increase of variability with stimulation strength. But for bifurcation dynamics, we predict um, a very specific uh, pattern of variability as a function of stimulation strength, where we see a burst of variability uh, around threshold because you have two types of trials uh, at threshold. And as you move away from threshold, you come back to uh, a single type of trial and variability decrease. So first we thought, okay, we're going to just look at the variability of activity across trials uh, to see what happens at different stage after the presentation of the stimulus to diagnose what are the dynamics, the trial by trial dynamics uh, um, in, in our experiment. So uh, if we first look at uh, the sessions where people reported the stimulus, uh, we see these uh, EG activations that are classical. So that's the auditory uh, N1, and then this late activation, positive activation, corresponds to uh, what we often call a P300. Um, so if we look at how uh, these activations uh, evolve as a function of stimulation strength. Uh, we can look at activity of these electrodes, for example, mean activity of these electrodes. Well, we see that indeed uh, the intensity of these uh, waveforms, here it's a negative waveform, its intensity increases. It becomes more and more negative with stimulation strength. Uh, and same for this uh, late activation it becomes more and more positive with stimulation strength. But we've seen together that uh, looking at mean activity as a function of stimulation is not diagnostic of whether uh, we are in the unimodal dynamics or whether we have a split between two types of trials. So we looked at uh, something that is seldom looked at, which is variability across trials. And what we observed is that during the first period, uh, variability seems to increase monotonically with the with stimulation strength. But during the last period, uh, we observed very clearly this uh, pattern of variability as a function of stimulation, where we have a burst of variability around uh, uh, minus nine dB, which was uh, our uh, threshold value. So this is a first suggestion that indeed this uh, initial activity uh, increases uh, uh, gradually with the stimulation strength and it follows stimulation strength, but that this last activity is triggered maybe in an all or none fashion and that this split between two types of trials is responsible for this uh, surprising pattern of variability. Uh, and we observe the same thing uh, if we do more fancy analysis, where we use multivariate pattern analysis to uh, summarize the activity on each trial. Okay, so uh, now that we've seen this uh, striking pattern in variability, uh, we can uh, we can do something more and and really fit our two types of models to our trial by trial data and do some Bayesian model comparison. And uh, what we observe, so zero is the moment where we presented the stimulus, is that uh, during the first 200 milliseconds after the presentation of the stimulus, uh, the, the winning model is the model with unimodal dynamics. And then we switch to bifurcation dynamics. Okay, next question. Since we're in the active session, uh, we, record, uh, we collected uh, participants' uh, subjective report. 
they told us whether they were conscious of the stimulus or not at the end of the trials. So does this split between two types of trials uh, in the late uh, phase of activation match this subjective report? Well, to assess that, uh, we can look at the uh, pattern of activity uh, when we sort the trials according to participants' uh, um, report, when they told us that they heard the stimulus versus not. And in bifurcation dynamics, we predict that when they say that they haven't heard the stimulus, late activations are not triggered, whatever the strength of the, the stimulus, that's the here, uh, but when they say that they've heard the stimulus, uh, activity is higher and it might be modulated by the strength of the stimulus. Uh, so that's the simulations. What do we obtain when we actually do that on the data, uh, on the late phase of activations? Well, we observe uh, the pattern expected for bifurcation simulations. So it appears that there is indeed a split between two types of trials and that it matches uh, the subjective report of uh, of our subjects. Okay, so uh, that's uh, doing the the standard type of analysis where we collect uh, the subjective report from our subject uh, and we use it to sort the trials. So going from subjective report to neural activity. But what's interesting here is that uh, uh, we observe this split between two types of trials just based on the actual uh, activations uh, without injecting any uh, information about uh, whether people were conscious of the stimulus or not. We derive it from uh, the analysis of the uh, brain trial-by-trial uh, trial dynamics. So it means that here we can do, uh, go from neural activity uh, to try and uh, predict subjective report without having injected any uh, prior on whether uh, the subject was conscious or not. So uh, we take uh, activity on one trial uh, at the late um, phase and we and our model gives us a prediction of whether this trial probably belongs to trials with high activity in which case probably the subject was conscious or whether it belongs to trials, probably trials with uh, low activity uh, and in which case we would predict non-conscious. So we tried to do that, uh, predict audibility response brain on neural activity alone. And we observed that we can do that with, uh, with mice uh, performance. So that's uh, trying to do that at various time points with data recorded at various time points after the presentation of the stimulus. And you see that we can do that very well, especially around 500 milliseconds after the presentation of the stimulus. Okay, so far so good, but uh, we're still in the situation where we asked people to report the stimulus. We're still in the active condition. Uh, so what happens in the passive condition? So as I told you, uh, there are two possibilities. First, um, this might correspond to uh, uh, the neural processes associated with conscious access, in which case, uh, in the passive condition, uh, on the trials where people uh, become spontaneously conscious of the stimulus, it should remain. Maybe it's uh, with less intensity, but it should remain. The other possibility is that this is only task implementation, in which case in the passive condition where people don't have to do anything on the stimulus, it should uh, disappear. So what, what really happens in the passive condition? Well, what we observed is neither of our two predictions, which is even better. So what happens is that uh, we still observe uh, late activations, although people do not have to do any task on the stimulus. We still observe late activation up until 500 milliseconds after the presentation of the stimulus. But this late activation has a different topography from what is observed in the active condition. It's not 
um, if, if for those who, uh, who know about that, it's not a P300, it's something else. So uh, what's possible is that this late activation here corresponds to spontaneous conscious access, and it's actually included uh, in the topography in the active condition, but on top of that, in the topography of the active condition, you also have the activation of the networks that relate to uh, task processing. Um, we can first validate this interpretation with uh, some uh, cross-classification analysis, but it's easier to see it when you do the source reconstruction. So uh, when we do the, con the reconstruction of brain activity corresponding to uh, late activations in the active condition, we see this global uh, workspace network. Uh, when we do the same thing in the passive condition, we see that we we see also uh, a quite extended network, but slightly different. And interestingly, when you do the difference, it's very focal and it's uh, in uh, executive area. So, um, and even motor control, motor planning. So that makes a lot of sense. And what we suggest is that if this uh, global activation in the active condition uh, can be called a global workspace, maybe what we have here in the passive condition is a global playground. So a situation where we still have this uh, global broadcast of uh, the local sensory uh, information, but not directed uh, for a specific task. Uh, and the difference then would be the task-related network. So we're currently investigating this uh, uh, hypothesis, uh, um, first in fMRI, but also with human intracranial recordings, notably with uh, Julie Boyer and Daphne rimsky robert Right, so um, the last question is, is this late activity probably relating to uh, spontaneous conscious access, is it showing uh, bifurcation dynamics? And the, the analysis of variability across trials suggests so. So it means that uh, maybe uh, we could try to read out whether people spontaneously became aware of the stimulus or not, based on the presence of this late activation. Well, the problem is that we, uh, in the passive condition, obviously people don't report the stimulus. But what we did is that on some trials, like 10% of the trials, uh, we didn't ask people to make a task on the stimulus, but we asked them uh, to tell us what was in their mind. Okay, so on, at the end of some trials, by surprise, you would be asked, uh, what's in your mind just now? And sometimes people told us that they were uh, absorbed in the in the visual tasks. Some people, uh, sometimes people told us that they were falling asleep. And sometimes people told us, "Oh, I had the sound in my mind." Okay, and we thought maybe uh, the presence of this late activation will be specific of those trials where spontaneously people tell us that they have the sound in their mind. So, in other words. Can our uh, analysis of uh, uh, trial by trial activity help us predict the mind wandering content? And uh, and it did. Okay, so it's less impressive than what we observe in the active condition because we have less uh, a, a smaller number of trials. But that's still very uh, encouraging that we can indeed predict based on the presence of this late activation. Um, the content of, uh, of the mind wandering uh, probe uh, at the end of the trial. Uh, and that opens the, uh, interesting perspective into probing conscious processing in uh, non-communicating patients, because uh, here we can read, uh, based on the trial by trial activity in the brain, we can in, try to infer whether uh, the subject was spontaneously conscious of the stimulus or not. 
Okay, so um, if I have a few more minutes, I think I'll uh, switch to uh, the second part uh, of what I wanted to show you. Yeah, that's totally fine. Okay, cool. Um, which is uh, the other part of the problem. How, how can we decouple conscious access from precursor sensory processes? Well, um, we can distinguish uh, basically two hypotheses. So some um, theories of um, conscious processing suggest that uh, we become conscious of the stimulus as soon as, as there is recurrent processing uh, uh, occurring in the sensory areas, within the sensory system. Okay, so in this proposition, um, becoming conscious is very linked with the buildup of the sensory information in the sensory cortices. Um, but as we've seen, uh, the global workspace make another proposition that uh, conscious access is actually linked with uh, a secondary process to these sensory uh, processes, uh, where these local sensory uh, activations are broadcast much more widely uh, in the brain. So how can we disentangle these two propositions? Well, we noticed that the global workspace view uh, makes a very counterintuitive prediction that at the extreme, um, there should be a dis um, it, we should be able to observe a desynchronization between sensory processing of a stimulus and the moment where we become conscious of the stimulus. Okay. For example, we could imagine that. Uh, um, in some situations, you have pre-conscious activity but failed conscious access. If that is the case, and and that this initial act activation still left some sensory traces in the, in the brain, maybe we can use retrospective attention to reactivate these unconscious traces and make people retrospectively become conscious of the stimulus. Okay. So, in other words, uh, this global workspace view and the idea that uh, conscious uh, processing corresponds to a secondary uh, process relative to sensory access predicts that we could um, experimentally trigger retroperception uh, at a, a variable interval after the presentation of the stimulus. So, we tried to test if this, this is possible uh, using um, um, behavioral studies first. And indeed, we could uh, demonstrate the existence of the, this, what we call retroperception phenomenon. Uh, in situations where the sensory input is too faint for people to actually see it, we show that if we uh, attract people's attention to the past location of the stimulus, after the stimulus has disappeared, we can increase the number of trials where people actually say that they've seen the stimulus, okay? And, and we can do that at a, a variable interval after this sensory uh, input. So this seems to be a first validation of this very counterintuitive prediction. But uh, we wanted to go further and ask, well, is retrospective attention really changing the fate of initially unconscious stimuli? And um, we started, so it's a preliminary data, but we started to investigate that by recording brain activity uh, using man magnetoencephalography. And so these are preliminary results uh, on this topic. Uh, where first we're going to see uh, uh, what um, uh, visual activity looks like uh, in the standard case uh, when a cue is presented before the target. And we sort the trials according to whether people have seen the stimulus or not. And we see that uh, seeing the stimulus in the, in the primary visual cortex is accompanied by um, better activity in the first 
uh, time window that might correspond to uh, a local recurrence and then uh, better activity in a second time window around 500 milliseconds might, that might correspond to this global broadcast and reactivation by higher level areas. Okay, so what happens when you present um, um, an attentional cue that comes after this period where uh, you usually become conscious of the stimulus? Well, what we observe is that uh, Apparently, this cue that comes after this period where, on the standard case, you become conscious of the stimulus, uh, still triggers uh, these two waves. So it seems that, thanks to the cue, we have the target triggering these two waves related to consciousness, and that the cue is triggering these two, uh, two waves relating to, to consciousness. So... Our interpretation is that here we have a mixture of trials. We have trials where people would have seen this, the, the target anyway because the, the initial uh, processing was strong enough. And maybe we have retroperception trials. Maybe we have trials where initially activity uh, on, um, in the scene trials, the initial activity uh, between the target and the queue was not different from uh, the activity recorded in a trial where you haven't seen the stimulus. And it's only the queue uh, that uh, made the difference and might, made you see the stimulus. So can we uh, sort out these two different uh, sort of trials? Well, what we did is just sorting the trials according to whether uh, 2A was bigger than 2B or the opposite. So when 2A is bigger than 2B, uh, obviously we observe that indeed these are trials where initially uh, the activation uh, was strong enough and the queue is only probably modulating this activation, but people were already conscious of the stimulus. Uh, but in the second case, uh, when 2B is bigger than 2A, is it just a modulation as well, but in the other direction? Well, no. What we observe is that indeed these are trials where the initial activity before the queue uh, predicted that the subject should not have seen the stimulus. And it's only the activation linked to the queue that made people see the stimulus. So that's one further step in the direction of saying, indeed, you can trigger conscious access uh, decorrelated or decoupled from the moment where you have a sensory buildup. So we're going to use that to try and um, 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 characterize the, the neural mechanism of conscious access independently from the initial buildup of sensory information. So to wrap up the perspective, uh, so we, we're, uh, we're lucky enough to have uh, obtained an our ERC that just started on this uh, project. And, and by the way, we'll soon be publishing a, um, a postdoc uh, job. So if you're interested, uh, please contact me. Uh, and in this uh, ERC project, we're going to pursue this experimental approach to characterize the core mechanisms of conscious access. And we'll also go on with a modeling approach to try and model this global playground that might be an addition to um, the, the initial global workspace. And, then, and we're also going to try and use these tools to have operational signatures of conscious access that we can notably use for diagnosing uh, conscious access uh, at the bedside for non-communicating patients. Um, and then just to conclude, I'd like to say that indeed this uh, conscious access part is uh, it's just one part of the, the, the general and fascinating uh, uh, problem of uh, consciousness, but uh, I have the impression that it might be a central brick that might help us understand how a conscious stream is con constructed. It might help us understand how more refined aspect of conscious access, uh, of of consciousness uh, can um, develop, and 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 my impression is that 
at some point it will have something to say about uh, uh, phenomenal consciousness that was referred to by uh, Axel. So I, I thank you for your attention and I'm uh, awaiting your questions. <laughs>